I'm Doug Ullman with the Civil War Trust War Department, sitting here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the angle of Pickett's Charge. I'm joined by Tim Smith, a licensed battlefield guide here in Gettysburg for over 20 years, and by Sam Smith and Gary Edelman of the Civil War Trust. We're going to talk about Pickett's Charge, its importance for the Civil War, and what really happened here. At 1 p.m., Lee bombards the Union defenses, hoping to soften them up. Meade responds, and together, they create the largest artillery barrage in the Western Hemisphere. Ultimately, Lee's bombardment fails. Nevertheless, Pickett's attack commences at 3 p.m. 12,000 men emerge from Seminary Ridge. They must cross one mile of open ground. What do you think is going through Robert E. Lee's mind when he's looking at this field and saying, I'm going to send 14,000 men across miles of open ground? Does he have any prayer that this is actually going to work? If I'm Robert E. Lee, I've got to be thinking, well, I've made some gains the last two days. Um, you know, maybe my artillery bombardment that just took place, uh, maybe it helped drive some of the enemy away. You know, for the last year or so, I've been successful in a lot of what I've done, and that's that same army that I've beaten time and time again. And I think, you know, Robert E. Lee goes into a battle every time wanting to win. And to him, winning is to destroy the enemy army, not just to push them away or something like that. He needs bold strokes to do it. And I think that Robert E. Lee, despite some waffling that day, is, is ready to win. You know, making these attacks paid big dividends early in the war when the troops were not as well disciplined and uh, inexperienced. But here, the Union Army of the Potomac is very experienced. And these are battle-hardened veterans on this ridge that day. These are many Pennsylvanians on their home soil. And they're gonna fight a little bit harder than they might in Virginia. There's been a tendency to point to the fact that what happened here was not Robert E. Lee's plan. That somehow there was another aspect of the plan that didn't come into play as it was supposed to, you know, like, Pettigrew not supporting Pickett as he should, the fabrication that Jeb Stuart was ordered to break through the rear of the Union line at the same point the Southerners were attacking the Union Center, or the bombardment was not as successful as Lee would have liked, or supporting troops of Longstreet from McClaws or Richard Anderson's division should have been uh, in a better position to make the attack and that these things would have helped the success of the attack. The problem is, when we look back at what happened, you know, uh, some of these things are not as well documented as we'd like. <laughs> we'd like, and it seems to me that what happened is kind of what Lee wanted to happen. It just didn't work out. Meade orders more than 20,000 reinforcements to converge upon the center. Ohio, New York, and Vermont troops position themselves upon the flank of the Confederate advance. The Confederates are moving into a great pincer of Yankees. How close was it in the fighting here at the Angle? I like to always talk about how, you know, you have 12,000 Southerners making the attack, but maybe a few hundred actually cross the wall or get to where we sit right now and actually get behind. By the time the Southerners actually reach this point, they have pushed some of the Union soldiers away. Um, they do see success on the horizon. They have, in a way, split the Union Army in two, but then they are confronted by thousands, if not several thousands, of Union troops converging upon them. And that's where these casualties come, is that a lot of them suffered on the way up and a lot suffered on the way back. It was Robert E. Lee's greatest defeat by far, which had been preceded by a moment of great hope. I don't think it's that close. I think that over the years, just for the purpose of drama, we have tended to make it appear as if the Southern Army is almost breaking through the Union line and, oh, they're just driven back the last moment. No, it was not even close. This charge was a disaster from the beginning. They had heavy losses coming across that open field. Uh, only a few of them reached the area. It was not close. 
but psychologically speaking, I mean, Robert E. Lee, he, he did want to destroy the Union Army every chance he got, but oftentimes he wouldn't even break a Union line, but he would deal with an army, and more importantly, perhaps, army commanders that would run away from him if he would strike a hard enough blow. As tens of thousands of Union reinforcements arrive, the Confederate attackers dwindle. Those who cross the stone wall are either killed or captured. Scarcely half of the men who made the attack return to Seminary Ridge. When you look at the Battle of Gettysburg, we are constantly talking about why it is that the South lost the battle. And we don't dwell on the fact that the Northern Army did a very good job, that General Meade created a very good defensive position. And General Meade had reinforcements in position to be sent into the Union Center, and he did that. He did a really good job. Yeah, and yet we still think of Meade as this sort of curmudgeonly small figure in the shadow of Grant. Why isn't Gettysburg sort of vault him into the pantheon of, of Union generals? Because he didn't write a book about himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good yeah. point. The impression, whether it's real or not, the impression about his pursuit after Gettysburg, um, Lee's so-called escape into Virginia, which I just don't buy. Nobody could really beat Robert E. Lee handily before, and suddenly, you know, somebody beats him, and because you don't bag the Confederate Army, 50,000 men under Robert E. Lee, you don't bag the Confederate Army very easily. It was hard when they were starving in 20,000, and they were outnumbered six to one at the end. So I think it's an unfair characterization, but I'll also go on record saying that Meade was fortunate to have Grant as the overall commander later. Meade, Meade did not put the pieces together the way that U.S. Grant could. And I thought Meade was in the perfect position throughout the rest of the war, and so was Grant. It's a huge percentage of people I take on the tour that believe that Meade was fired after the battle. And I'm sure that impression today is given people because of the popularity of the PBS series, the Ken Burns series, kind of, you know, makes it appear as if Meade doesn't play a role in the war after the Battle of Gettysburg. But he does come in the Army of the Potomac for the rest of the war. He is the first man to ever decisively defeat Robert E. Lee in combat. Now, obviously, people also on tours have a tendency, if they've heard about Meade, to overemphasize the fact that he was unable to force Lee to surrender after the battle. And I usually try to make two points when people ring this up. And one of them is the fact that General Meade had just lost more men than any other American army had ever lost in any battle on any war in American history. And he won. <laughs> and the second point is that Robert E. Lee doesn't want to surrender. <laughs> How can you force Lee to surrender? How long did it take after Grant was put in command for Lee to surrender? How come Grant didn't force you know, Lee to surrender the first day he took command or the second or the first year? <laughs> but 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 let's bring it back. But let's bring it back here. Talking about turning points, you know, the very next day, July 4, 63, is the day that that U.S. Grant captures Vicksburg. Uh, you know, we we tend to now think of that as far more important. And yet Gettysburg lives on as this a as this iconic moment, this turning point in the Civil War. You know, what what's going on here? I would by no means say that people think that Vicksburg is more important than Gettysburg. I still think the popular among Americans, they would say Gettysburg is the turning point of the Civil no, but War. Among historians, and it's really important. historians but, certainly. And historians are, I think, still divided on it, you know. And I never call Gettysburg the turning point of the Civil War. I'm not one who says it's unimportant like some historians. I, <laughs> I think it's very important, especially for what it prevented rather than what how it changed the existing thing. I, I think historians that fight the other way tend to leave that out, but I don't even think it's a close fight, a uh, close analysis in terms of comparing Gettysburg to Vicksburg. I don't think Gettysburg can claim to result in the loss of uh, tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of miles of square miles of territory for the Confederacy. Gettysburg could not have disrupted the Confederate effort the way that Vicksburg did. Vicksburg suddenly lost most of their access to salt and beef and all these key supplies. It cut the Confederacy in two very viably. Um, I, th I can't, I don't even see them in the same ballpark in terms of importance but I still call Gettysburg a very solid turning point in, in what it prevented and what uh, Gettysburg could have been had not the Union Army and George Gordon Meade acted the way they did. And also on July 4th, 1863, you've got Braxton Bragg evacuating Middle Tennessee 
opening oh, up. Oh, here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> Sam with his unknown battles. Uh, but I would say that maybe even evacuating Middle Tennessee is more important. No, <laughs> the, no than Vicksburg in uh, actually affecting the direction of the war effort. I mean, Mississippi was all. It was always going to be lost to the Confederacy. It was too far away. They, they can't throw their lines out that far. Uh, I think the Confederacy still has a fighting shot without Vicksburg, more so than they have a fighting shot without Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Interesting. I disagree, but very interesting. interesting. So there you have it, a half-baked idea from Robert E. Lee, followed up by some hard fighting from John Gibbons' Union Division. That sums up the turning point of the Civil War for me, gentlemen. What do you think? Perfect. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sam disagrees. But whether you, whether you agree with us or not, guys, I want to thank you for being here today, and I thank you all for watching. In your years of study of the Civil War, is there some overarching thing about the Civil War, something you've learned about the war you'd like to share? I think it's maybe not just, maybe not about the war, but just in general that as, as the more I read, the more I learn, you understand that it's about personalities. People shape events and people's relationship shapes, uh, shape events. You know, if there's no Grant Sherman friendship, there is no victory at Vicksburg or the Atlanta campaign. Basically the whole last half of the war hangs on that on that relationship. And similarly, in the early part of the war with Lee and Jackson, those, those relationships are what build the success or failure of any endeavor. And that's true in the Civil War and it's true in elsewhere in life. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Let's go. I'm Doug Ullman with the Civil War Trust War Department. I'm standing here at Fort Morton, a key Union artillery platform on the lines outside of Petersburg. Behind me, over my shoulder, was Elliott Salient, a key Confederate earthwork defending Petersburg. On the morning of July 30th, 1864, Union troops exploded a mine underneath Elliott Salient and rushed into the breach created by the explosion. The battle, known today as the Battle of the Crater, is one of the most notorious and talked about incidents of the entire Civil War. So whose idea was it to dig the mine in the first place? The mining idea developed on June 21st, 1864 with Colonel Henry Pleasance of the 48th Pennsylvania Infantry looking across a narrow field of land separating the two sides and he thought that mining would be a great idea in this particular area of the Confederate and Union positions. Burnside, the Corps commander, was uh, quite enthusiastic about it. Uh, Meade, I think, uh, allowed it to go forward. I think he thought, well, at least it will give the men something to do uh, during the summer months. Grant, of course, was notified of it as well, uh, and he gave it the go-ahead. If it works, wonderful. If it doesn't, well, what's lost? So this is Burnside's baby. Who does he choose to make this attack? So Burnside has uh, four divisions that he can use um, here in this position, and he selects um, a division of, of black soldiers uh, led by Edward Ferrero, and he selects them because it's a, it's a division that is fresh. There's other three white divisions have been fighting through the Overland Campaign. Uh, many of them t are tired, they need rest, and so Burnside thinks that his, the, his best bet, if you will, is to use uh, his black soldiers, the 4th Division. And on July 28th, General Meade informs Ambrose Burnside that he doesn't like his battle plan to use the colored troops first or to do all the maneuvering. Meade says that it would have been impolitic to send out the colored troops first because if they were slaughtered by the Confederates and then the white troops run in and capture Petersburg, it would appear to the north uh, that they had just used the black men to be a shield to the white troops. Uh, Burnside is forced to make a, a drastic revision in plans. Uh, he's forced to, to have one of his white divisions take the lead and the fourth division will uh, ultimately follow up once the attack takes place on July 30th. So the mine explodes and the troops rush in, then what happens? In the aftermath of the explosion and the initial troops deploying, uh, many of them will be caught in the crater. As more Union troops get on the field, however, the Union troops by default get pushed outside of the crater, trying to push forward uh, against the Confederate line. The intense artillery fire, as well as small arms fire, will prevent Burnside's white divisions from making a lot of progress by 8 in the morning. So one of the things you hear about when you, uh, with the Battle of the Crater is this idea of no quarter being given. Where did that idea come from and how did it play out here at the Crater? Well, there, the call of no quarter or the battle cry of no quarter is the battle cry of the 4th Division as they're charging 
into the crater uh, on July 30th. And not just No Quarter, but No Quarter Remember Fort Pillow. And, and these are references to uh, the many reports that have filtered uh, throughout the ranks, the Union ranks, uh, that a massacre had taken place uh, in April of 1864 at Fort Pillow, Tennessee, where uh, where a large number of black soldiers were uh, massacred by Confederates. The fear of black armed men had long permeated the white South since the colonial era, uh, no matter where slavery had existed. And so this was a fear that predated the Civil War. As many uh, Confederate soldiers said, their blood ran uh, hot and they responded uh, very hotly throughout the course of the day, especially towards the afternoon as all the reinforcements are on the field and the Confederates engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the U.S. colored troops. But some men are actually taken prisoner, uh, both white and black. What happens to them after effect? So it's an interesting story what happens to the Union prisoners. Uh, it's, uh, it's on August 1st. Uh, they are paraded through the streets of Petersburg. Um, now, Petersburg, of course, it's important to remember that the Confederates were defending a civilian population in the summer of 1864. And Confederate uh, authorities uh, made the decision to march the prisoners up and down the streets of Petersburg. Uh, they actually uh, interspersed the white and black soldiers. It's, it's a way of sort of illustrating what's at stake in this war, right? This is a controlled example of race mixing uh, that's going on in the streets of Petersburg with these Union black and white prisoners. And, and, uh, and I think it would have been acknowledged as such by the remaining civilian population that came out to witness this uh, sort of unusual event. Now, the year before, Grant's troops had exploded a mine under the 3rd Louisiana Redan at Vicksburg. Why do we remember this crater more than that one? I think, in part, because the Eastern Theater has always fascinated people more than the Western Theater. Even at the time of the war, Lincoln complains, Grant won all these victories in the West, yet people keep focusing on the East. Uh, and so here at, at Petersburg, I think another part of it is that we have the engagement of white Union troops, white Confederate troops, black Union troops, and Native Americans. And so the combination of the uniqueness of the different groups of people that are here helped to create a sustainability of memory here at the crater. The Battle of Bull Run began on Matthews Hill, over my right shoulder, where an understrength Confederate brigade guarded the Army's left flank. The Union Army committed 15,000 men to an early morning attack on this hill, but the stubborn Confederate resistance slowed them down for more than two hours. Eventually, however, the Confederates began to pull back off of Matthews Hill towards Henry Hill. Two Confederate brigades rushed into the valley to try to stem the Union tide and cover the retreat, and the valley became a chaos with thousands of men firing muskets at close range. The Confederate line bent backwards under the Union assault to be anchored in the tree line over my shoulder. In that tree line was a brigade of soldiers under the command of the young and eccentric Thomas Jackson, an artillery instructor from VMI. His cannons pummeled the Union soldiers as they reformed to meet the new line. The fighting in the valley had thrown the Federals into confusion. It took more than two hours for units to be reassembled and for orders to transmit to launch an attack on Henry Hill. Confederate officers used that time to skillfully reinforce their lines and to set up a sharpshooter nest in the home of the widow Judith Henry. As the Union cannons took position, the sharpshooters in the Henry house took aim. The shots whistling among his crewmen prompted Union artillery officer James Ricketts to open fire on the Henry house, killing the widow as she took shelter in the yard. They wheeled artillery up the hill and initiated a close range artillery duel that prompted some Confederate infantrymen to surge forward and try to capture the Union guns. The guns changed hands many times as the melee swept back and forth across the field. 
the Union soldiers could see dust rising from the south. More Confederate reinforcements were approaching the scene. First, a cavalry charge led by the young Jeb Stewart crashed into the Union right flank just beyond the Henry House and sent tremors through the Union line. And then the arrival of two Confederate brigades through the Union line into the ultimate panic that would prompt their retreat back towards Matthews Hill. The day began with great promise for the Union Army with the capture of Matthews Hill. But as they tried to press the advantage and capture Henry Hill, they suffered reversals and eventually a retreat that would force them to abandon all gains. Under Confederate pressure, the retreat became a rout and the day became a disaster for the North. I'm Doug Ullman with the Civil War Trust. I'm sitting here on Henry Hill at Manassas National Battlefield Park. I'm joined by Jim Burgess, museum specialist at Manassas National Battlefield Park, and also by Gary Edelman and Sam Smith of the Civil War Trust staff. Guys, thanks for being here today. Thanks. My pleasure. There's a lot of confusion that surrounds this battle, so why does McDowell's force fail to, to really achieve its objectives? Well, McDowell's force does have a few big successes. The, the arrival of Tyler's division to, to pinch off Matthews Hill probably being the main one. They, they also have failures such as, you know, Keyes not being able to get his attack off even though he's sitting right behind the Confederate lines here. These people are very confused and the battle is much larger than any of them anticipated. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is, you know, many of the regimental officers you know, at the lower echelon levels, the lieutenants, the captains, even the colonels, many were just politicians in uniform who could barely march their men in a straight line on the parade ground, let alone on the battlefield under fire. You know, the regimental commanders were not up to the task. So there's a lot of political pressure on Lincoln and the Union Army to sort of bring this war to a head. Gary, yes. how does that sort of factor into the strategic plan here for the Federals? You have uh, troops who signed up for 90 days, and that, those 90 days are coming up, so they have to fight pretty soon. Uh, nobody's been trained in anything resembling brigade or division level combat. Uh, there's nobody alive in the country, really, or at least in these armies fighting here, that has commanded more than a couple of hundred men at a time in battle. As soon as uh, they received the first volley, many retreated back to find cover and concealment as quickly as possible. Many of these regiments just scattered in every single direction imaginable making it almost impossible for their inexperienced officers to rally them again. So other fresh units had to be fed into the uh, fighting here on top of this hill, and more often than not, they were thrown up into the fighting here as they arrived on the field in a rather piecemeal fashion. Yeah, so let's go to that. Like, why did the Confederates win this battle? What I guess I would lead with is that as the day goes on, the Confederates have a strong position up here on Henry Hill. and They've got a show of artillery force and the Union is doing the attacking. A lot of the attacking usually favors the defender and the Union is attacking one regiment at a time. And as they are wasting their strength, up comes from Joseph E. Johnston, all these Confederate reinforcements. So as the Union is weakening, the Southerners are getting stronger right when the Union Army couldn't afford it. In short, they had enough troops at the right place at the right time. Yes, Jim could have yes. said it much better than that. <laughs> okay, so the one thing we haven't really talked about, we've sort of hinted at it, is the, the da dazzling array of uniforms that were worn here. You have mm -hmm. men from both north and south who are wearing not only blue and gray on both sides, but we have men wearing red and all the you know, Highlanders wearing their plaid uniforms. I mean, why is there this proliferation of so many vast uh, styles of uniforms, Sam? Oh, well... You know, at the time the war breaks out, the regular army is minuscule, 16,000 soldiers. Lincoln calls for 75,000 state volunteers. But there's no army structure in place to, to take all these people in to adequately supply them with food or with uniforms or with weaponry. You also see a dazzling array of different small arms being used on this field. They very quickly realize, based on events that happen here, that they need to work out the uniform situation if they want to know who's coming towards them they're going to have the same troubles out west at wilson's creek as a matter of fact we can't have uh, any conversation that doesn't bring us no, out west can we? <laughs> no western theater today says doug uh well we will uh overlook the bull run of the west for now but suffice it to say that there were m many times in these early battles when the uniform confusion actually made a significant tactical difference it led to reversals mostly for the Union side, actually, mistaking Confederates to be friends. Yeah, in, indeed. Uh, to 
add to what you've said, you know, of course, in, in the antebellum period, you know, the militia units, north and south, traditionally wore gray uniforms, and many of these same militia units, you know, came to the battle dressed as they were originally uniformed. Uh, so you had just as many Union regiments wearing gray uniforms as there were Southerners wearing uh, gray. But then some of the companies that had only recently been mustered into their regiments had not yet been issued uniforms, so they were still running around in their civilian clothes. I mean, you could have a blue or a gray uniform, but if it gets covered up with dust, it's all going to be the same color anyway. Yeah, it was a very sultry Sunday afternoon. There wasn't hardly a whisper of wind, and much of the smoke from the musketry and artillery fire just lingered on the field. You could barely see from one side of this field to the other. And there were times you couldn't even see 100 yards in front of you, owing to this very dense white sulfur smoke. Well, we now know a lot about this battlefield. I mean, Jim, how long have you been working here at Manassas? 33 years. So you've been studying this battle for 33 years. And I still don't know it. And you still, <laughs> but you think now, knowing all that you know, that you could have won that battle if you were Erwin McDowell? No one had commanded an army this large before. The logistics were mind boggling. And um, you know, under the circumstances, I don't think I could have won on the Union side either. So do you think, Sam, having worked with Gary, do you think that Gary could have won this battle if he were Erwin McDowell? Gary, no, I don't think he would have won the battle. <laughs> well, then I wouldn't uh, think you would have won the battle either. <laughs> the reason I think you wouldn't have won the battle is, is because as these attacks are coming up against Henry House Hill, they're facing heavy artillery fire, you know, local Confederate counterattacks. We know now that Jackson planned to stay, stand here like a stone wall. McDowell did not know that in those two hours. We can't expect McDowell to have been able to say, no, I'm only facing Jackson and uh, some reinforcements up here, and they, they plan to hold so I can get around them. I think you would have been confused, like McDowell was, by the nature of the fighting on Henry Hill. You know, I actually uh, was with a ranger one time on a battlefield, and he said, I think very wisely, that I, I give tours under the assumption that on my best day, I couldn't have done as well as any of these generals would have done on their worst. And I think that's pretty good advice, actually. People who have been under fire or commanded a company or even a regiment or something like that in today's army would probably tell you something similar. So the Union forces just completely confused, demoralized, and running at fast, as fast as they can back for Washington, right? Why couldn't the rebels have captured Washington City on July 21st? It's difficult for us to envision the carnage on this field after the battle, and it had a shocking effect upon the participants. General Jackson volunteered to lead the pursuit into Washington if he could get 600 fresh troops. But of course, it wasn't part of Southern strategy at this point in time to uh, be on the offensive and capture Washington. At this point in time, the South only wanted to go their separate way and fight a defensive war. They really did not have the resources to wage an offensive campaign. Yeah, I would also push against the idea too that the Union retreat was an all-out hell-mell retreat, that is, until they reached Cub Run later. I mean, the, the Union was making stands in Centerville where they have even more troops and some fortifications yeah, and things yeah. like that. So, yeah, it, so it wasn't a complete route, and many units left the field in good order, probably more than, more said they did than there actually were, but uh, in any case, uh, the U.S. regulars under Sykes uh, certainly covered the retreat pretty well. Uh, of course, Stewart's pursuit of the Union Army toward Sudley Church uh, ended more or less at Sudley Church after he had rounded up so many prisoners he just did not have enough men to uh, carry on his pursuit. Sam, uh, can you just sum up this battle in 30 seconds? Go. The Union has a great morning and but as the afternoon goes on they've captured one hill they try to capture a second hill and that's a hill too far and the retreat from that hill turns disastrous and it really shapes the mood of the nation and the spirits of both sides relative to each other as the war goes forward. Gary. The Union and the Confederacy both impatient to try to bring this whole war, this conflict to a head, march out from Washington and they meet each other along the banks of Bull Run. The Confederates had fortified well, but the Union gets around those areas, makes some initial gains, whereas the Confederates kept getting stronger throughout the day by bringing troops to this area by rail, where they're eventually able to uh, envelop the Union forces, push them back and force them into a route back to Washington, D.C. Jim. Uh, the Union Army that marched out here was the largest army that had ever been assembled in this country up to that point in time. This would end up being the largest battle ever fought on this continent up to that point in time. After all the dust had settled, some 1,500 Union troops were 
killed or wounded. Some 1,900 Confederates were killed and wounded. No American army had ever suffered losses of this magnitude before. Neither side had really anticipated such a bloodbath and uh, neither side was really prepared to care for so many casualties. The dead and wounded littered these fields for days afterwards. No longer would there be any illusions of a short war. Okay, so the Battle of Bull Run, a day of firsts, followed by a fight for a hill too far that ends in a rout and changes the country's perception of what war is really gonna be about. All right, thank you guys for being here and thank you for watching.